Good morning, church. Uh, welcome. If this is your first time uh, here at Harvest, welcome, welcome. My name is uh, Kenyatta, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here. And today we begin an amazing journey, a journey that we have been praying and planning and thinking and talking about for several years now. We begin a journey through the book of Revelations. And uh, it was during COVID that our preaching team, several members of our preaching team, we spent several weeks just going through the very first three chapters. And what we were doing, we were looking at it and trying to outline it. And we are starting a new series today uh, in Revelation. And what we're going to do is that we're going to cover the first three chapters in this mini-series, and we are calling it Good Church, Bad Church, right? Good Church, Bad Church, because what we're going to see in these three chapters is what does a good church look like? And that's what we want to be, amen? We want to be a good church. We want to be and do the things that a good church does. But we're also going to see what a bad church looks like. We don't want to be a bad church, amen? We want to be a good church. So this is going to help us to see what a good church looks like to be a good church, while at the same time to stay away and to move away from the things that make for a bad church. So the title of this sermon is actually called The Promise of Revelation. And this is an amazing book, and we're going to have an amazing journey. But I must say this, we are not going to preach the entire book in one sitting. So we're going to preach these three chapters for the rest of the year. Then we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with chapters 4 and 5. And then we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back with chapters 6 to 19. And that's going to talk about all the visions and the judgment and the seals and the trumpets and, and a seven-headed dragon. All the things that you love. All the things that you want to hear in a sermon. And then we're going to end it up in the final two verses where everything is made new. Everything is made new. A world that is destroyed by sin will be renewed by the grace and by the power of God. And this is going to be amazing. One of my favorite books, uh, there's this phrase, I'm paraphrasing it. It says that, that a good journey should be shared. A good journey should be shared. And this journey that we are going to go on should be shared. So let me encourage you right now, if you have your Bible, I hope you have your Bible, you came to church, right? You're in church, you should have your Bible. Revelation chapter 1, this is so easy to find, it's the last book in the Bible, you don't have to go to the table of contents, just flip the Bible over, and then flip the page, and it's right there, Revelation chapter 1. Now if you need a Bible, right, just raise your hand, keep it raised, and one of our ushers will come and they're going to get that Bible to you. So I see a few hands are raised, right? And then if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that Bible. It's yours. Take it home. It's our gift to you. We want you reading God's word because we want to be a church that, we are a church that preaches God's word. And then when you uh, get that, remember Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to look at the first three verses. And then we're going to look at, um, the next four verses. So this morning we're going to be in chapters one, in chapter one, sorry, from verse one to eight. But we're going to split it up a bit, right? We're going to look at the first three verses, and then we're going to look at the next four verses because they're so important, right? So, chapter one, verse one. Drum roll. No drum roll. No drum. Okay, good. All right. So, so it begins, uh, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. For the time is near. 
Now, before we unpack these three verses, um, it's, it's important that I give you uh, the reason why this book was written. There's, there's no book like this in Scripture. Revelation is a unique book for several reasons. Let me tell you why this was written. There were uh, several churches in a place called Asia Minor, which is now called Turkey, and these churches were at a crossroads. Uh, persecution against these churches uh, was on the increase. Some of them had begun to compromise with the culture they were living in. Others had begun to question God's control of the affairs of the world. And still others had turned away from God. So God gave Jesus, who gave his angel, who gave John a vision, a prophecy rather, to speak to these churches and to us by extension to encourage those who were suffering. All right? This is what Revelation is about. It's to encourage those who were suffering persecution. It, is to, it was to prepare them for the future. Because there was a future that was coming that they weren't aware of. And this future would, have in, would entail uh, more suffering. The future would also entail more judgment because sin and evil would increase. But not only was this book designed to prepare the church for the future, but it was also to give them a better hope for the future. That though sin would increase, and though evil would increase, one of the things that's going to happen is that God will ultimately be victorious over sin, over evil, and Satan. So this book was written as an encouragement to a bunch of Christians who were suffering, who had compromised, and some had turned away. That's the purpose for this book. To bring those who had gone, to bring them back. To bring those who were weary and to give them strength. This book is as much needed today as it was then. On top of that, Revelations um, shows us uh, a, key, a key thing here. There's a, there's a major theme in the book and that is uh, we have to look at life uh, from two perspectives. And the two perspectives is this. What is real to us in the physical and what is real to us in the spiritual? And we have to look at life. We have to look at the affairs of life in those two perspectives. Because what was happening is that the churches, when they looked around, what they saw was that evil was winning. They saw sin increasing. So, so, so they got the perspective that problems and frustration and distress was the order of the day. However, the other perspective, as we are going to see when we hit chapters 4 and 5, but we are also going to see it in the other uh, chapters, the other perspective is that God is in control and his promises and plans and power will prevail. Now this is so important because all of us see life through these two perspectives. If you go to a particular um, office or a particular place, and you get frustrated by the service or the lack of service, you could leave there thinking, life is frustration. You can leave there thinking, all about life is frustration. And if you uh, read the news or you uh, listen to certain uh, media outlet, you could walk away with the perspective that, that this world is going to the dogs. Or you can have the other perspective that God is in control. And this world is going according to his plan. And his promises prevail. And I want to challenge you because we are going to be challenged over and over to choose one of these perspectives. We're going to be challenged to see the world as being orderly and structured and going according to God's plan. Chaos will not win. Evil will not win. 
Sin will not prevail. God will have the ultimate victory. And the churches that this letter was written to, they needed that. And we need that perspective today. Uh, this book was designed to reorient the believers in those days to the idea that God is in control. And not only was it designed to reorient their perspective, but it was to encourage them to hold fast to Jesus. As Revelation chapter 2 verse 25 says, hold fast what you have until I come. And that's another point of encouragement I want to share with you, loved ones. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to the promises that God has given you. Keep a hold of him. Do not lose heart, loved ones. Do not lose focus. Endure what needs to be endured. Leave behind what needs to be left behind. But hold on to Jesus. It may be difficult now. You may be challenged. The temptation may be on the increase. The desire to compromise or to slip up may be there, but I want to encourage you to hold on. It may get worse before it gets better, but hold on. Because ultimately, in the end, Jesus wins. There may be some of you here, you are holding on. I mean, you are barely holding on. And you barely made it here this morning. My encouragement and the encouragement you're going to get from this series and from this book is to endure. It's to keep holding. It's to keep pressing. Hold on to your faith, loved ones. Don't let it go. Now, there are three words in the first three verses that we are going to look at. And the first word is the word revelation. So write this down. This is our first point. Write this down. At the book of Revelation uncovers God's truth. The book of Revelation uncovers God's truth. Now the word revelation in the original Greek in which this book was written is the word apocalypsis, from which we get our English word apocalypse. Now the meaning of this word apocalypsis is this, to uncover and unveil. To pull back a covering or a veil that is hiding something. Apocalypse means to make known or to reveal something that was hidden. In other words, the book of Revelation is, is, is this radical uncovering or breakthrough of what was previously hidden. And that is what uh, uh, God uh, spoke to Jesus who spoke to the angel, who spoke to John. He was revealing to him, to them, and to us something that was hidden previously before. Now, because God is making known to us what was once hidden, it shows us that God cares about us, loved one. God cares about us enough to show us and to reveal to us things that he kept personal, things that he kept secret, things that we could not have discovered on our own through human wisdom. God loves us so much that he wants us to know the things that were hidden. So, so guys, uh, we don't need to, uh, to, to fall prey to the marketing scheme that says, if you read this book, this is a, a special book, and this book is going to reveal uh, prophecies from 1,500 years ago, and you'll get, you're going to get the secret of life. We don't need that. In God's timing, when he's ready, and when he wants to, he will reveal to us things that have been kept secret to us. And that is what... This book is about God is revealing to us things that no one knows. Now, in our time, the word apocalypse has also come to mean something else. It's come to mean disaster or, or massive disaster. Additionally, or, or, or furthermore, it has also come to include a category or a genre, genre of writing called apocalyptic literature. 
As someone once said that a revelation is considered apocalyptic literature because of what it describes. And revelation is describing the end of the world. It's describing supernatural battles that are being fought between good and evil. It's describing judgment and redemption. But it's also describing hope and renewal. But it's also apocalyptic literature because of how it describes these things through the use of symbolism. Right? So that brings us to this point. Although the book of Revelation uncovers God's truth, it is very symbolic. It is very symbolic. So one Bible scholar said that what John heard, he described it verbatim. So when John heard the angels say, this John wrote it down. However, when John saw something, and there were over 60 visions that he saw, he had to use images and symbols and analogies to properly explain his experiences. And that's why if you read the book of Ezekiel, you keep hearing things like, you know, well, I saw something and it looked like this. It doesn't mean that it was actually that, but he's trying to understand it. He's trying to paint a picture, and John is doing that. So he keeps saying, I saw this vision, and it looked like this. He's using images and symbols from his own experience and from the experience of his readers to make sense of what is not very clear. So, so sometimes... What John did is that he described characteristics of what he saw rather than what the thing actually looked like because he had never seen something before. If you have never seen something before, how are you going to describe it? How would you describe it? You will say, well, you know, it looks like a wheel in a wheel, but there's a bigger wheel around it because that's the reference you have, a wheel. Let me give you one example. In Revelation 12, chapter 3, Satan is described as a dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. Is that how Satan looks? No. He doesn't look like that. Now, what is John trying to say to us? John is trying to say to us that Satan is powerful, he's highly intelligent, and he's malicious. Jesus, in Revelation 5, 6, is described as a lamb that was slain. The idea that John wants to communicate to us is uh, Jesus' sacrificial death, his innocence, and his ultimate victory. So the use of symbolism is meant to convey complex theological truth in a concise and vivid manner. It's in the same way a picture convey um, things that words cannot. I don't know if uh, some of you remember this, but, but Sammy is right there um, a few years ago. Is it, has it been a few years, Sammy? Um, he had a program. Uh, remind me of the program, the name of it. How, how it works. How they work. And what he was doing is that he was taking very complex things like how does the government operate? How does uh, uh, financial markets operate? And he was putting it together in, in two and four minute segment to explain to people how it works. Right? So, 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 so what John is doing is that he's using symbols, he's using images to explain things that he's seeing in heaven things that he's never seen before, images that he's never come across, and he's using symbols. So, so there are a lot of these symbols, and, and people read Revelation, and they think, you know what, I can't understand this, because there's a sea, and then there's a beast, and the beast has wings, and it has this, but it has the head of a, of a, of a no, I was going to say goat, but there's no image like that, <laughs> right? It has the head of a, of a cow, and, and the face of a man, and then there's this creature with eyes all around, there's this creature with six wings. What is John doing? He's trying to help us understand things that are inexplicable. Things that we can't see. It's like when you have a dream, 
and you wake up and you can't remember what the dream was but you remember the sensations and you just remember our fleeting things that is what john is doing that's why revelation 1 says this the revelation of jesus christ which god gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place he made it known by sending his angel to his servant john and look at what verse 2 says john bore witness to the word of god and to the testimony of jesus christ even to all that he saw and there were some things that he saw that the angel said to him don't write that down in other words people ain't ready to to get that don't write that down but he bore witness so here's this and here's the point though the uncovering of god's truth in revelation is highly symbolic it is trustworthy we can approach this book with confidence knowing that it is designed for our blessing and encouragement and let me say this guys it is understandable all right for every series i say this read ahead read ahead make your own notes and i'm going to encourage you to do the same read the book of revelation and keep reading it and for this entire series keep reading it and and knowing this that it is understandable we can get it we can get it it is there for our blessing how do i know it's trustworthy how do i know that we could rely on this how do i know that we could understand it well again look at what verse one says uh, uh, it was god who gave this revelation to jesus who then gave this revelation to an angel who then gave it to john who then wrote it to the seven churches in asia minor it's understandable it's trustworthy it came from god so the same god who gave moses insight and wisdom to write the first five books of the bible the same god who filled david's heart to write amazing poetry and songs it's the same god who gave this vision to john so we can trust it now after saying all of that let me say this because this is important the use of symbols is designed to conceal truth from those who are spiritually blind and dull while revealing it to those who are genuine saints i'll say that again the use of symbols is specific it is designed to conceal truth to those who are spiritually blind while at the same time reveal truth to those who are spiritually alive it's like a code that needs to be understood so the symbols in revelation have both a hardening effect on the unbeliever while it has a shocking effect on the genuine saints so a non-believer reads revelation and they do not believe god it hardens their heart whereas a believer reads revelation and it shocks them but it shocks them into action because of its sense of urgency now uh, uh, i know this is a little difficult for us but but consider how jesus used parables when he was on earth matthew chapter 13 verse 10 I'm, and i'm going to read the entire thing it says then the disciples came and said to him why do you speak to them in parables and he answered them he answered and said to them sorry let me read that again then the disciples came and said to him why do you speak to them in parables and he answered them to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of god but to them it has not been given for to the one who has more will be given where am i losing my way i need new glasses where am i verse 12 for the one for i'm tempted to take it off for to the one who has more will be given and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away 
Verse 13. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear but never understand. And you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now listen to this carefully, right? In the same way, in the same way, the things that Jesus shows us in the book of Revelation are for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. For those who refuse to see and hear, the secrets of Revelation will remain locked all the time. For the spiritually blind and the spiritually dull, Revelation will always be a mystery to you. You will not understand it you will not get it you will be confused by it and because of that i want to encourage you open your eyes open your spiritual eyes and ears seek the holy spirit's enlightenment of the truths in this book because if you don't if you don't use the lens of the holy spirit you are not going to understand what this book is all about this is a hard saying, but it is a true saying. And let me say something that's even harder. And, you know, I don't, this is not designed to empty the room, so to speak, right? But if you realize that you are not getting it as we are teaching through this, that's a sign of your spiritual state. It's a sign of your spiritual state. But if you are getting it as we, going, as we are going along, and it's becoming clearer, and your heart is burning within you, and you want more, and you can't wait to read it, and you're doing it for your devotion, and you're consuming what it says, and you're praying to the Holy Spirit and saying, give me insight, give me light. If that is happening to you, then you are spiritually alive. This is an amazing journey, as I said. But this book is going to test us. It is going to test us. Which is a good thing. Amen? Amen. Point number two. The book of Revelation uncovers God's plan for the future. So I said there were three words from the first three verses. First one was revelation or apocalypsis, the unveiling of truth. The second word is prophecy. And this is implied by the phrase, the things that must soon take place. Uh, meaning it is something that will take place in the future. More specifically, John calls it prophecy in verse 3 when he says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So it was apocalyptic, but it was also prophetic. So we can rest assured that the prophecies in the book of Revelation are certain to come to pass. This is a book of prophecy. And why? Because one, they came from God himself. If God said it, it will happen. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. And the second reason why we know these prophecies will come to pass is simply because God knows the future. He knows the future. And when he says that uh, the things which are revealed must soon take place, notice John isn't saying that it might happen or it could happen if specific things happen. He is convinced that it will happen. He's convinced that these prophecies will come to pass. And loved ones, we similarly need to be convinced that the prophecies that are found in this book will come to pass. Judgment will come. Evil will be defeated. 
persecution against believers will increase. It will come to pass. And because the prophecies are certain to come to pass, we need to be spiritually vigilant. This is not the time to fall asleep spiritually. We need to be spiritually awake. We need to be in our word, not our word, well, rather the word of God. We need to be praying. We need to be in an accountable relationship with others. And I want to encourage you, if you are not yet in a discipleship group, um, our small groups are going to go through this. This is a perfect time to jump in because we are going to sit down and we're going to discuss this more in our groups. We need to be spiritually vigilant in this season. Here's the other thing, third word. What's the first word? Apocalypsis. Say it, say it, apocalypsis. No, no, no. Again? <laughs> All I'm hearing is... <laughs> First word is apocalypse. Second word is prophecy. Third word is blessing. Straight from the text. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. You want to hear something really cool? No other book in the Bible says this. Yes, we are blessed for reading and studying God's word, but no other book in the Bible is as specific as this. No other book says, if you read this and you listen to what it says and you keep it, you will be blessed. So that alone tells us that revelation, this book is something special. Now when John wrote the word blessed, he did not have the idea of happiness in mind. And happiness is... Um, um, a part of blessing in, in, in the sense of the word that is used um, but instead he had another word another Hebrew word this word is called ashar it's A-S-H-A-R and that word also means blessed but, 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 but the blessedness that word describes is very unique because it means to find the right pathway in the face of false pathways. It has to do with the discovery of meaning in the face of chaos. So when John says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, John is saying that by doing this, by reading this, by studying this, by knowing this, you are going to know the right pathway. You're going to know the right path for life. You will choose the right path while saying no to false paths. You will be able to have clarity amidst the chaos. One person said that uh, the times may be dangerous and awesome, which is what John was talking about, but neither the circumstances nor a timetable about potential circumstances are themselves the pathway. Our worth and the meaning of our life come from God's decision about us and not the dangers we face or the times of our history. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? It's not the circumstances that define our lives. It's God's decision about our lives that define us. Not your circumstance. It's not your bringing. It's not what you have had to experience. It's not your present situation that defines you. It's God's word that defines you. If God says something about you, that thing is true. And if God calls you a saint, you are a saint. If God calls you blessed, you are blessed. If God says you are complete in him, you are complete in him. If God says you are forgiven, you are forgiven. If God says you are, the righteous, you are righteous in Christ, you are righteous in Christ. And your circumstance has nothing to do with that. We can live in the present with confidence because Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. So while life's events impact us, they do not define us. They don't. And that is what success looks like. It's walking confidently in Jesus 
regardless of the circumstances that we're experiencing. And I want to say that again, loved ones. Your life circumstance does not define you. Whether you think you are uh, successful and have all of life's uh, um, um, comforts, or whether you think you don't have, that doesn't have meaning. At the end of the day, it is what God says about you. So loved ones, walk confidently in Jesus. Walk confidently in Jesus. You will experience blessings because you will be on the right path. So as such, uh, do this. Pay close attention to what this book says. Yes, there are some hard parts and there are some hard things to understand, but ask the Holy Spirit for clarity. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a soft heart. Ask the Holy Spirit uh, for mental clarity. Secondly, be ready. Be ready. It says these events will soon take place. Now, I know what you're thinking because I thought the same thing. You want me to tell you what you're thinking? You are saying this book was written 2,000 years ago. And it says, these events will soon take place. And that's 2,000 years ago. And since I was young, my granny used to tell me, Jesus coming back soon. My granny died 50 years ago. Well, if you're over, you know, if you're old <laughs> like that. And Jesus hasn't come as yet. What does this mean by soon? Let me say this. This delay might seem to be a problem. How could we reconcile 2,000 years with the idea of soon? Well, for one, uh, Jesus in Matthew 13, 28 and onwards, and Paul in Romans uh, 16, 20, uh, the, their use of the word soon is not a strict timeline. They don't use it in the sense of a strict timeline. Like, we are going to start church at 9 o'clock. Instead, they use the word soon as a call to readiness. Urging believers to be prepared at all times. Some events described were imminent for the early church. But soon in this context is more about hope and preparedness. Reminding us that God's timing is different from ours. So the soon doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. It could. The soon means be ready. Be prepared. Be always prepared and be always ready. And here's the third thing. Hold on. If you're going to receive the blessings of this book, you have to remain steadfast. You have to hold on to the faith that is mentioned in this book. You have to hold on to the hope that it covers. You have to hold on to the promises that it gives. You have to hold on to the encouragement that it spreads. Hold fast to Jesus. Now, that's just the first three verses. Right? And I want to summarize that the book of Revelation uncovers God's truth, it uncovers God's plan for the future, and it uncovers God's blessings. So here's what we're going to do now. The next four verses, we're going to go a lot faster. Right? Uh, so eyes in scripture again, look at verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, why did John... What was special about these seven churches? So there are two things. Um, 
these churches were located in some very strategic places. So it could have been that these churches were chosen because of their location. So this letter would have gone to them, and they would have read it, and then sent it out to the other uh, churches in smaller cities. Or right? well, the second reason could be that um, the number seven, which is going to occur a lot in this book, um, this is what is called an apocalyptic number, and the number seven represents fullness or completeness. The idea being that these seven churches represented the problems that existed in all other churches. So they were either a representative or they were chosen for their strategic location. However, write this down. Grace and peace are yours today. Grace and peace are yours today. Look at the greeting. Grace to you and peace. Why is this significant? It's significant because this letter is going to churches and to believers who are suffering persecution. It's going to churches and believers who have lost their homes, they've lost their friends, some of them they have lost their businesses. What do you think they need? They need to hear that grace and peace is available. Just like you and I need to hear that grace and peace is available. So if you are ill, you need to hear that grace and peace is available. If your relationships are going sour, you need to hear that grace and peace is available. If you can't find a job, you need to hear that grace and peace is available. And that is what God is doing. He's reminding these churches that no matter what they're experiencing, no matter the circumstance, grace, which is God's favor, and peace, which is wholeness, is available. And loved ones, that's the message to you this morning, that grace and peace is available. And you know what's amazing? Is that this grace and peace is coming from God the Father. How do we know it's God the Father? Well, because of what it says here. Uh, um, um, I, him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, this, this phrase here is a paraphrase of what God said to Moses in Exodus 3.15. When God said to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, this is God's self-description of his eternal nature. So it's God the Father who's saying to you that grace and peace are yours today. But this also comes from the Holy Spirit. The text says that the seven spirits who are before his throne... Before the Father's throne. Again, I told you the number seven is really important in this book. And here seven indicates the perfection that is found in the Holy Spirit. But it also reflects the description of the Spirit in Isaiah 11.2. Where it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So the grace and peace that is available to you, loved ones, is from God the Father, and it's from God the Holy Spirit, and thirdly, it's from God the Son. It's from Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who's described here as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. You know what that tells us? That Jesus is faithful, he's victorious, and he's powerful. So loved ones, grace and peace is available to you. And you know that tells us that that tells us that we need to receive it. If grace and peace was available to those churches 2,000 years ago, it's still available to us. But here's the thing. Those churches did not receive the grace and the peace that was available to them. Those churches, as I mentioned, in a, were located in a place called Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. And several places where the church was once prominent, those places are now controlled by Islam. But here's the thing. It wasn't Islam that destroyed the church. 
You know what destroyed the church? The church. It was the church that said no to God's grace and peace that destroyed the church. It was the dull church that destroyed the church. It was the spiritually blind church that destroyed the church. It was the bad church that destroyed the church. In other words, the church isn't destroyed from without. The church is destroyed from within. Because the Bible tells us that the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. So when you see a church breaking apart, it's not outside forces that have destroyed it. That church went rotten from the core, from the inside. Because that church rejected God's grace and peace. And in parts of the world where the church is growing and it's bursting, like in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, they have accepted the grace and peace that God has on offer. But in places where the church isn't growing and the church is suffering and the church itself has become callous and the church is compromising, many parts in the Western world, they have rejected the grace and peace. So here's the warning, loved ones. If you reject God's grace and peace, if you reject God's grace and peace that is on offer, destruction awaits. But if you accept the help that is available to you, the help that is available to us as a church, we will thrive and flourish even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of difficulties. And we have a perfect example. Many of you know this, right? Uh, this is not our property. And many of you have seen a for sale sign outside. So our landlord is selling the property. So in a few weeks or in a few months, we could go from this, having a place to meet, to not having a place to meet. But God's grace and his peace is available. In other words, God's help is available to us and we are making use of it that's why we have uh, this this 21 days of fasting because we are crying out to god and say help we need help we need help we can't do this we can't do this we can't build something in two and a half months we can't raise the funds to build something uh, uh, that's going to stand in two and a half months we can't do this on our own but with God's help, with his grace, and with his peace, anything is possible. It's just like Jehoshaphat, when an army of a million is coming against him, and he cried out, God help! And he said, our eyes are on you. And that's what we're doing, because we need grace and peace, and God is offering that. So don't be troubled, and don't be burdened. God's grace and peace is available to you. Accept it. Receive it. Amen? Amen? Here's the second point. Worship Jesus. Look at verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's the gospel there, loved ones. That's the gospel. And I'm saying that I'm just hearing Donnie's voice in my head, right? How he gets excited when he sees the gospel to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. Why should we worship Jesus? Why should we worship him? Well, one, because he loves us. It's very clear here. It says it to him who loves us. But secondly, we should worship Jesus because he has redeemed us. He deserves our worship and our devotion because he has freed us from the bondage of sin and from the consequences of sin through his blood. Redemption is the paid release from sin's grip, accomplished by Jesus' death. When we put our faith in Jesus, he breaks the chains of sin that we cannot break for ourselves. We cannot break it for ourselves. We have tried, I have tried, you have tried, and nothing happens. But here's what. Jesus' blood 
is sufficient for my sin. Jesus' death is sufficient for my sin. And not only has he freed us from sin, but in addition to that, he has freed us from the suffering that sin brings by applying his blood to our life. We are freed from the suffering. As I've said several times, not original to me, choose to sin is to choose to suffer. But when we accept the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus, the penalty of sin is removed. And the suffering of sin is removed. So why should we worship Jesus? Because he loves us, because he has redeemed us, and because he has empowered us. Empowered here is the idea, is expressed here by the idea that we are a kingdom, meaning we are a people called to serve as ambassadors. And we are priests in that kingdom, called to serve as ministers and worshipers. We have been empowered to approach the throne of God. We have been empowered to intercede for others. We have been empowered to be ambassadors for him. We have been empowered to serve him. The Spirit of God is in you if you have put your faith in Christ. And you have been empowered to live a righteous and holy life. Stop walking around defeated. Stop walking around defeated. Stop acting as if you are defeated. When the Spirit of God lives in you, when the Spirit of God flows through you, receive the grace and mercy. And then here's the final point for today, verse 7 and 8. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Here's why you need to worship Jesus. Judgment is coming good place for an amen judgment is coming judgment on sin is coming and it's coming as sure as you are if you pinch yourself and you realize that you exist that level of surety judgment is coming and he's coming with the clouds. This, the, the word clouds here is representative of the glory of heaven. Clouds have been always associated with God's presence in scripture. The Bible says uh, that every eye will see him. When Jesus comes back to bring judgment, it won't be secret. It won't be for some and not others. Everyone alive will see it and know it especially those who pierced him, meaning those who nailed him to the cross and those who have chosen not to repent. If you reject Jesus and his forgiveness, you will be judged. It is sure. Your judgment is sure. And I'm not trying to frighten you into heaven, but this is the reality. If you reject Jesus and you continue to reject him, you will be judged and you will be found wanting and you will suffer. And it's not good to say that. It is frightening. It is scary. Just the thought of it is making me tremble. But it is coming. Judgment is coming. And that's why we should worship Christ. And that's why we should put our faith in him. And that's why we should follow him and hold fast to the faith that we have we could be tempted as we look around we see evil happening and it it appears as if the wicked are prospering but their judgment is sure in this world and in the world to come and we'll see it in revelation we will stand before the throne of god we will stand before that throne and we will be judged according to what we have done with the knowledge that we have had about Jesus Christ. But loved ones, judgment is coming is not something, uh, uh, it's not only a warning, but it's an encouragement to choose to accept the grace and peace that Jesus offers. Because if judgment is coming, guess what's coming also? Salvation. Salvation for the righteous. Freedom for the righteous. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Let's pray.